We have the Community Church of Orange with us tonight. Will you give them a praise? Amen. We have their pastor, Stephen Samuel, with us tonight. Will you give him a praise? I cannot express to you enough how excited I am about the unity that has come about through a vision that this man of God, this pastor had. And because of it, we have a lot of different ministers in our area of different denominations praying together on a weekly basis, believing God for a revival in Orange County. And I'm just going to tell you, we prayed this tonight when we prayed together in my office. Barriers being removed, denominational barriers being removed has been in the way of kingdom work for too many years, and we're here to end that tonight. Yeah. We're here to end that tonight. Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that maybe this pastor prefers it this way, or this church likes it that way, or this church maybe even believes a little bit like this, and we believe a little bit by, like that. What we have found through the unity of what this brother's vision had, and this is what we're doing even when we do from February the 28th when we do the United We Stand. All that matters up front is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Yes. And that's it. That's it. And if we introduce people to the name of Jesus, they accept Jesus Christ in their personal life. You know what? The Holy Spirit can do the rest with whatever he wants. Amen. 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 It's just God is great. Amen. Supposed to say all the time. All the time. All the time. Well, he's the Father, we thank you for your presence here tonight. Father, I thank you for your faithfulness to come where your church is gathered and your presence to abide here with us. And even tonight, Holy Spirit, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name. Come on, give Jesus a hand tonight. Amen. 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 Well, it is an honor for us to be here tonight, our community church team and my wife is here with me and thank you Pastor Harlan and Miss D. Thank you so much for having us. We are honored to be here and uh, uh, he's taking a big risk turning me loose. The only Indian in a house of cowboys. <laughs> I know how this story goes. <laughs> I want to honor Pastor Johnny who's also here from Destiny Church with his crew here. It's such a good thing to be here. Uh, a number of months ago, Pastor um, Matt Chandler from Life Church connected with me and said, let's start a network in this chair area of all of our pastors getting together, and Pastor Johnny and Pastor Shane from uh, the Nazarene Church and Pastor Harlan and a number of pastors came together, and we just began to, we ate. That's what pe preachers do when they get together. We ate, and uh, some are better at it than others, and I'm not saying any other things besides that. And <laughs> But then we began to pray together, and it was powerful, and it was, and we were continuing every week. Pastor Johnny and Shane, they're leading the charge on that, and we're praying for not just unity for the sake of unity, but we believe, as your pastor does, that the Lord has a work for Orange County, and you're a part of that. Amen? And you're a part of that, and, and tonight, I just want to share a word with you, and I would say a brief word, but I'm not going to lie to you and then disappoint you later, but I just want to share a word with you that I felt the Lord put on my heart for us as a church body and then also for this church family as well. And so I'm going to start off with a story, and then I'm going to share a couple of scriptures with you, and at the end, I'm going to let Pastor Harlan come and close the service out. I was, uh, started the ministry when I was young. I was uh, probably, what, 16 years old when I began the ministry. I had a radical encounter with the Lord, raised in a pastor's home. I'm a preacher's kid. Uh, second generation preacher kid and knew everything about church growing up. Like many of us in the Bible Belt, we're kind of in the buckle of the Bible Belt. Everybody here has some exposure to church to some degree coming up, growing up here in Southeast Texas. So I was raised in Bridge City, 
you know, most of my life, actually, Nederland, Port Natchez, and Bridge City, and then went to school right here at Community Church, and raised in church culture. And what that means is, a lot of times, you can get inoculated to what it really means to follow Jesus. And then the danger of it is, you don't know you're that inoculated or that you're calloused many times to what it really means to follow Jesus. Because we can equate following Jesus with going to church, with doing spiritual things, reading our Bible, and, and you know, praying a lot and fasting. And those are spiritual disciplines that add to your faith, but they are not the faith. The faith, or what it means to follow Jesus, is to hear his voice and obey his commands. And if that's not happening, then you're just praying and you're just reading and you're just going to church. Some of y'all are like, I wasn't ready for that one yet. Take it easy, preacher. But I was 16 years old when I began to follow Jesus, had a radical encounter with him. And I remember shortly after that, my dad, of course, being the pastor, made me the youth pastor because I was free. <laughs> and so to begin youth pastoring as a teenager, and as I was youth pastoring, and of course, you know, you're talking to 1994, 1996, over time, over the next six years, I would be in youth ministry. And what happens is you can get very... Um, callous to what it means to follow Jesus. And I remember uh, the year 2000 was approaching, and a, and a good friend of mine invited us to a big prayer event in Washington, D.C., and I went there with our youth group, my youth group of, what, 30-something kids, his youth group of however many kids, and we all loaded up a plane and went. And as we were there, I was at a crisis moment in my life, as all of us are in crisis moments, seasons of our life. And in that crisis moment, the crisis was this. I didn't know what I was doing. I was a youth pastor. I knew I was called to the ministry. I was in college at Lamar University. I was getting a business degree because I thought that was a good idea. Uh, you know, didn't have a lot of great things going on in my life. I was barely making it, you know, from paycheck to paycheck, struggling, and I'm pretty much on the cusp of just quitting the ministry. And that's a reality for many ministers, just struggling because it's kind of like the police. The only time you get called is when there's something wrong. And after a while, your heart can get to a place where you just get tired of life. And you don't have to be a minister to experience that. You can experience that anywhere. And I remember going to this event in Washington, D.C., and they asked us to fast and pray all day. So we were fasting uh, and praying. And, and we get to the main mall in D.C., and I was just about ready to throw in the towel. I was thinking, God, after this event with this youth group, like any other youth camp experience, I'm going to go back. I'm going to be burned out and frazzled, and then I'm just going to resign. I'm going to go into the business world, finish my degree at Lamar, and then go into some kind of entrepreneurial venture or business or whatever it is. And so I kind of didn't have my mind made up, but I was kind of moving in that direction, but very frustrated, just not having a sense of purpose. Now, listen, I was born again. I thought I was following Jesus. I was going to church. I was tithing. I was, I was doing all the, I was checking all the boxes. But there was something that was missing. How many of y'all can ever feel that way? I'm checking all the boxes, but there's something that I'm missing. And I remember it was late that night, we flew into D.C., and we were staying at a friend's church, and they had opened the chapel up, and they were having a worship set that night before preparation for the next day where we would stand at the Capitol at the main mall, and we would pray all day for the nation at the big turn of the century. And as I was there in the corner, kind of in the, in the back corner of the sanctuary, I remember on my knees just really putting in my resignation, <laughs> Lord I don't know what's going on. Relationships in my life were fractured. Relationships with parents were fractured. Very alone, very, I don't know what to do with my life. And I remember them singing that old Hillsong song, Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment that I'm awake, I live for you alone. And as, as the, the last lyrics of that song began to echo in my head, I remember I was there on the ground. I wasn't asleep. I was wide awake. Large amounts of coffee contributed to that one. Wide awake. And I remember looking up very brokenhearted, very discouraged. And as, as you look up to the ceiling, I looked up to the ceiling in that sanctuary, which was a white tiled ceiling with, uh, you know, squares that you could count for end days on end. And looking up, and all of a sudden, that ceiling began to roll back peeled back as if it were just a curtain. And this penetrating light 
began to pour through. And when I say penetrating, it wasn't so bright you couldn't look at it. It was so bright you could not feel it going through you. And there stood in the exposure of that radiation, Jesus. And he, with everything you've read about him, his eyes were full of fire, a flame of fire. And his voice sounded like many waters. And he said, Stephen, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you and created you, ordained you to be a prophet to nations. Follow me. And I remember him, not in speech, but in thought, speaking to me, this is what you will do. Go to nations and preach this gospel. And the force of his presence was so powerful, all I could think was crawl under the pew, under the carpet, because you are about to die. I wish I could tell you I had some whimsical thoughts and, you know, jokes to tell him, but when the force of his power shows, everything of your humanity is diminished in the greatness that he is the Lord, and you are not. And his weightiness, or as the scriptures would say, his glory fills the room. And it felt as if it was years sitting there in his presence, and me within thinking, don't think anything stupid. Every part of my body, I can tell you, shaking, vibrating under the power of Jesus. In a moment, the window closed, and I was wide awake, and I laid on the ground for what seemed like hours, shaking underneath the presence of a force outside of our realm. And I tell you that story to say that encounter would begin many more encounters with Jesus in my life. In fact, in John chapter 14 to 17, Jesus says it like this. He says, I will manifest myself to you. I will manifest, make visible by seeing myself to you. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, I will come and the Father and I, we will show ourselves to you. And how is it for so long in our lives, and even in, in Christian circles, we can live a whole 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years and never experience Jesus? We would think any other relationship, that's an impossibility. To have a great relationship and never see and feel and hear the one we love. And yet we have excused ourselves many times in a religious thought process that I don't have to really be that close to him. I'm just here on the bandwagon to not get into hell. But here's the truth. Jesus never put that as a carrot in front of his disciples. Follow me, you won't go to hell. In fact, he kind of gave the opposite picture. If you follow me, they will hate you and persecute you for my name's sake. But it's worth it because the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. And I would say as I came out of that experience and, of course, radically changed my trajectory in life, there was something I was created in my heart or began to be exploded in my heart, this desire of, I have to see him again, again. More than any other passion, more than any other desire, more than any other amount of money, amount of power, amount of influence, you cannot escape that desire, because once you see him, you want to be like him. Because as he is, so are we in this world. We want to be like him. Not in a, a, a climactic become like God, but in a I want to be his son. And I want to see the father. And that desire in us is birthed because the spirit of God dwells in us. He cries out from within us, daddy, father. We long for him. 
And every believer that's ever called on the name of Jesus, whether you've had a radical experience or not, if the vote is up to you and you say you want to experience Jesus, it's always a yes. And if it's not, then you don't know the Father. Our spirit cries out, Daddy, Father. And I would come back as that sto- as the story goes on, come back to my youth group of 30, radical, preaching, crazy machine, and then learned in the principles over the next few years, decades of my life, how do I get back to that place? And the truth is, I can't go backwards. I can only go forwards. Because seeing him and experiencing has to grow more and more so that one day you will be like him. And you might think, well, Stephen, that's not for me. I'm just, I'm just a good old country boy, and I just want to live life, do good things, get good things, have a good life, and be a nominally good person. That's not a package in the kingdom of heaven. It's not there. It's either you give everything, go all the way after him. And I'm not saying it just has to be enamored with emotional zeal. It's enamored with devotion and pursuit. I must find him. How do I get there, Stephen? How do I do it? Do I have to come up to the front and everybody lay hands on me and, and have this great emotional experience? I wish I could tell you that would work, but there's a time when it goes beyond an emotional experience where you need the presence of God in your home, in your car, in your health, in your finances. How do you get that life radiating power inside of you, out of you, through you, in you, around you all the time? Because that's how we were created to live. Paul says it like this. In him we live and move and have our being. Like I can sense, should always sense as a believer, the presence of the Holy Spirit speaking to me all the time. We know that good old Psalm, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, leave me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. David is not talking about just a metaphorical imagery of what God may want to do one day, he's speaking just as close as the shepherd is to the sheep. The Father longs to walk and live with us. How do I get there, Stephen? I would love to tell you, read your Bible more, pray more, and that's part of the package. But a lot of it, I would say, goes a little bit deeper. It gets into your heart. There's some things here that have to change to experience him coming near to you. That's where it's at. That's where the conduit to his realm into your realm, that's where it connects. It's in your heart. The manifesting of God's presence in our culture, learned through the years, I would say, comes to this one simple principle. And it's one you won't probably expect. It's through the principle called honor. And you think of that word, and if you're a Marine or a soldier, you probably understand that in a dynamic a lot more than we do. But in the scriptural context, honor has some very powerful implications. And I'm telling it to you as a church because for what God wants to do in Orange County, there must be an honor for him and an honor for his word and his people. Because honor is the currency by which power is transferred to people. The word honor in the, in the scriptures is the word kabod. It's also translated the word glory. The word honor, as we, as we speak of it, it's, it's, it's a practice in our life. And I want to just hit a couple of things with you tonight, and then we'll wrap it up about honor. But it's a practice in our life that if you will commit to moving in honor in your life, and not just a token agreement in your mind, oh, I need to be more honorable, I'll do honorable things, but I'm going to pursue a lifestyle of honoring God, honoring people, it can bring the glory of God into your life and then bring it through your life. What is honor, or how do we honor? Well, honor begins with a choice not to dishonor people. You can think in your head you're being honorable all day, but when you choose to dishonor people, the presence of God withdraws. Because when you don't honor people, God doesn't honor you. That's the scripture. That's not my opinion. 
Honor is a choice not to dishonor. And listen, in our culture of social media and posting and blogging, we have a liberty many times of hiding behind the computer and spewing out dishonor for people we don't like. Let me tell you a little secret. The people you don't like need to be honored the most so they see Jesus the greatest. But when you dishonor people, you close the access point they have to the power of God who resides in you. But when you honor, it allows them to see that they can be ones who receive honor because they are made in God's image. Honor begins with choosing not to dishonor. The next thought, honor shows in how we speak to authority. Honor shows in how you speak to authority. And why is this authority thing such a big deal? Because God put it in place. Whether it's parents, grandparents, police officers, governors, presidents, honor is shown in how you treat them. You cannot say, I'm honoring God, but talk bad about X, Y, Z. Say, well, I got to let people know my opinion. No, you don't. Well, I just can't help it. Yes, you can. Well, I got to tell the truth. That's not the truth. Jesus, he's the truth. So when you tell the truth, you should be talking about him. Your opinion is just that, your opinion. And for the most part, it should be kept to yourself if it's going to show dishonor to the king and his kingdom because you are an ambassador of that kingdom. Well, Stephen, if I don't say something... God can do a lot more without your mouth than with your mouth when it comes to honor. When it comes to honor. Now, how you honor other people, I know you're thinking, well, Stephen, how does this have to do with that radical experience that I want to have with Jesus? Because you can't set yourself up for a radical encounter with him when you have dishonorable encounters with people everywhere else. When you honor people in your life, whether you agree with them or not, it opens the door for God to draw near to you. Because he honors honorable people, right? I honor God by showing how I speak about authority. Proverbs 20, verse 3 says it like this. It is honorable for a man to stop striving since every fool can start a quarrel. Well, you know, that's just my personality. I like to, I like to have a little, little pick and fun and argue a little. That's not personality. That's called a problem. That's called dysfunction, because we are called to be people of peace. But when you move into honor, people, you will find the, the rapid friction in your heart to fight can be soothed by the presence of God. And we call that many times deliverance. When you're set free from your opinion, honor comes by how you honor God, by honoring authority in your life. The second thing, honor comes by, y'all with me? Honor comes when you, honor is a practice of honoring the Lord with your possessions. Now, I know this is a big one, right? But I'm going to hit it because I know it works. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 through 10, he says it like this. Honor the Lord with your possessions, giving him the first fruit of all of your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with wine. Now, Stephen, are you preaching about tithing as a guest speaker at my church? You bet I am. You bet I am. And let me tell you why tithing is so important. It is not about money given to the church. It's about you honoring the Lord. If you don't honor the Lord with your finances, you are setting yourself up for financial disaster. And I'm not saying that like it's some kind of spooky heebie-jeebie curse. This is the word of God. Honor the Lord. So this is what that means, because I work a job like you work a job, and when I get my paycheck, I tie the first 10% before taxes and FICA and all that stuff. I take 10% out. 10 out. You know what I do with that 10%? I say, Lord, this belongs to you, because you are worthy of the labor of my hands, and I'm going to honor you by giving this 
like you told me to. And when I honor the Lord, he what? Honors me. Listen, I was raised, born in the most abject poverty in the slums of South India. And you know the one, one of the first principles my parents taught me? Honor the Lord with your tithe. Of all the people who didn't have money to give, we were them. But we honored. And God has honored us greatly. It wasn't a lottery ticket. It was the hand and the favor of the Lord in my life. And I'm telling you, this honor principle with your finances keeps wealth from becoming an idol in your life. When you honor the Lord with your finances by giving him the tithe, it keeps corruption and greed and selfishness out of your heart because you're saying, this is the Lord's first. Which puts everything else into perspective that I have comes from him. One last thought. There's only two things you can do with the tithe. You can return it to the Lord or you can steal it. That's it. You can return it because it belongs to him or you can steal it. And I don't care how much money you don't make or how much money you do make. This is not a principle about just money. It's about honor. Honor is giving Jesus what's first in your life. And all throughout the scriptures, you see this principle from Passover to the tithe to the first day of the week. We give him what? What's first. I know some of you are probably thinking, man, this is, seems like a little bit of just, you know, cornbread and butter kind of teaching. But here's the deal. This kind of principle of honor is what can open the door of God's presence in your life. It does. And let me tell you, I can, I can tell you so many stories, if we had time, of how honoring God with the first thought of your morning. How many of y'all ever do that? You, you're in bed, you roll over, you grab your phone, and you start scrolling. And the first thought of your morning has now been given to whatever social media platform, rather than roll over, get your phone, or turn your phone music, or worship, and say, Lord, I just want to honor you the first thing this morning. And begin this conversation for this day with you. I've been doing that for I don't know how many decades. And you know what's crazy? He speaks to me every morning. Stephen, God never speaks to me. Maybe because you don't honor him with your time. And when we honor him with our time, here's what happens. He draws near to us. In the book of James, it says it like this. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Right? Honor is giving Jesus the first what if I'm not experiencing the presence of God in my life? How do I get there, Stephen? I would say the simple principle of honor can radically transform your life. With your words, with your behavior, are you honoring the Lord and are you honoring people? Are you honoring the men of God, the women of God in your life? Are you honoring the authority, parents, grandparents? Well, Stephen, you don't know what, how bad they are, what they've done to me. That has nothing to do with the principle of honor. Because the worse they are, the more demands that you honor. And that doesn't mean agree. It means I'm going to choose to honor you because of the command on my life, not the behavior of yours. I'm going to honor you because the God in me and his presence near me is what I treasure. And he functions in an atmosphere of honor. I have to honor the Lord with my finances. And we are a wealthy, wealthy nation. And the one thing that destroys our life many times is the greed for more. But when we honor the Lord with our tithe and our offerings, what does it do? It removes that idol from our life. We honor the Lord by putting away the life we want to pursue an experience with him in the life that he gives. Proverbs 29 says like this, man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. The humble in spirit will do what? Retain honor, and that word means what? The glory of God, the glory. Here's what I'd like you to think about as we wrap up this morning. Eric, come help me out. We're seeking the Lord for a region. 
And when I say that, it's not we hope it happens organically. We hope that one day we wake up and everything is awesome. It takes a lot of work. And the work that it takes is not so much campaigning and planning and organizing, though that's a part of it. The work that it takes is every heart in our church community begins to be transformed by Jesus. Because where does honor begin? In your house. Husbands, how you treat your wife. That's where it begins. Parents, how you treat your kids. Mom and dad, how you treat your employer. Because if they don't sense the presence of God coming from you, there is no honor in it. Say, I want God to just show up at my work and everybody to get saved. But the problem is, if you're being dishonorable, griping, complaining, barely doing your job, that salvation is not coming through you. And you might be the only conduit to which that redemption can happen. So maybe you have to do like I've had to do many times and humble myself and say, God, I've been one proud, arrogant, foolish, dishonorable man. And I need to humble myself and lay down my pride to give you honor and honor those you've put in my life. Say, well, Stephen, is dishonor a sin? No, not necessarily. But it grieves the Holy Spirit. It grieves the Holy Spirit. And when he's grieved, he doesn't show up. And I don't know about you, but if he doesn't show up, there's really no other reason for you to show up. He has to be there. And so this evening, as as we wrap up, I can sense the heart of the Father for our region and this church body and our church body and Destiny Church, all the churches in this area. How are we going to see God's kingdom come? Is it getting the right candidate into office? No. Is it have the right amount of jobs in the area? No. It's when God's people who are called by his name will humble themselves and seek his face. As 2 Chronicles chapter 7 says, if my people who are called by my name will do what? Humble themselves and seek my face. And here's the, here's the hard part. And turn from their wicked ways. You might think, I don't have any wicked ways. But listen, when we treat people, talk about people, act in a way with our finances that's dishonorable, that is called wicked ways turn from their wicked ways. Then God says, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. And tonight my question to you is, what areas in your life of dishonor have you allowed Maybe knowingly and somewhat just, I didn't really think about it, but I've been a jerk. Or maybe I didn't really think about it, but I need to get some things in line in my finances and my time with the Lord to honor him. See, the first step toward honor is noticing where there is dishonor in your life. And you take that to Jesus, and I know a lot of us think we want to change a whole lot of stuff. Let's just start with one thing tonight. Attitudes of your heart that dishonor the Lord, the authority in your life the things that God's given, people that God's given to you. And tonight I believe that God is speaking this to us because he wants to shift some things, shift some things to make this house a place of his presence, a place of his presence, because there's such great honor for each other, great honor for the leaders, great honor for the authority that God has put in this house. And when the Holy Spirit sees that, he says he draws near to the broken and the contrite heart. 